Hello to everyone. My name is Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I'm coming to you from the homelands of the Piscataway people, which is now known as uh, Maryland, just north of the head of the serpent, or what other people like to refer to as Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm the chief executive officer and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs. And welcome, welcome to uh, the seventh annual repatriation conference. This is the first um, major conference panel day. We started, uh, we opened uh, on Monday, November 1st, with a wonderful prayer from Cecil Pavlat from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe, and also some wonderful videos from the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, Brian Newland, and the Assistant Secretary of wild, uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Shannon Estenos, um, as well as some other wonderful guests like the president of the association, uh, Frank Edwagishik. Um, but today we're gonna start off talking about NAGPRA. In fact, all of our panels today are centered and focused around NAGPRA compliance and um, how to do NAGPRA to the best of our abilities. Uh, our panel today is called Getting It Done is Getting It Right. That's my type of panel title. Broadening Perspectives on Cultural Affiliation. And so we're going to start off our time today. I'll uh, let you have it, Melanie. Um, it's all yours. Thank you, Shannon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's it's nice to be here to, to start off um, the first session um, on the first full conference day. Um, and uh, we're going to engage this morning in some storytelling. Um, each of us has a, a part to play in this story, and we're going to share a bit about our part. Um, I, uh, I had a thought this morning um, that the story we're going to tell you is, is a bit like a fairy tale in, in some ways. And, and by saying that, I, I certainly don't mean um, to in any way diminish the significance or importance of the work that we're going to talk about. Um, but I do think it helps to kind of think about it in terms of, of a, a typical fairy tale. And, and um, it might help you see the roles that, that each of us played um, in this story a little bit more clearly. Um, so by way of introduction this morning, I will introduce um, to you um, first Meg Cook, who is the Director of Archaeological Collections at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And uh, in our fairy tale version of NAGPRA this morning, um, Meg is both the knight in shining armor and the damsel in distress. Um, and really, um, this story is Meg's story. Um, Amber and I both play more of the supporting role um, to Meg's quest um, for repatriation. Um, and also with us today is Amber Hood. Um, she is the Director of Historic Preservation and Repatriation at the Chickasaw Nation. Um, and of the three of us, I would say that, that Amber probably looks a bit more like a Disney princess. Um, but in this fairy tale, um, Amber plays the role of the townspeople um, who ultimately find peace and rest um, through the uh, fairy tale story. And I am Melanie O'Brien, the manager of the National NAGPRA program. And uh, my role in this story is really as um, uh, the wise wizard um, who imparts uh, information um, to the to the knight um, that helps uh, her on her quest. And um, as most fairy tales go, and as you'll see as we we go through this story, um, the the knight knew uh, had the had the knowledge and the ability the whole time. Um, my role is simply to help her realize it. Um, so we're going to go through the story, starting with me, uh, followed by Meg, and then Amber will, will conclude. Um, we will have plenty of time for questions, um, so feel free to put things in the Q&A um, or in the chat. Um, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to speak with us directly. Um, before we dig into our fairy tale today, I wanted to... Um, 
first of all, let everybody know um, that I'm going to be describing uh, the ancestors um, in this story with some detail. Um, that's not something I typically do. Um, and uh, it is not something that uh, the, the Chickasaw Nation in particular um, uh, usually wants to happen. Um, but Amber and I discussed this before um, in planning the session. And Amber felt that there was some benefit um, to me providing some more detailed description of the ancestors in this instance. So I wanted to be sure everybody was aware that, that um, at least I'm going to talk in a bit more detail. Um, and I, I want everybody to be prepared for that. Um, so I, I would like to say, I would like to start with just maybe a, a brief moment um, where everybody can prepare themselves um, for the discussion today. We'll just, we'll just take a brief moment of silence. Great, thank you. So our story today begins um, in a um, in a, a a limestone tower at the um, on the top of the limestone tower, the seventh floor, um, or what is also known as um, the interior building in Washington D.C., where my office sits on the the seventh floor. Um, and uh, uh, the story really begins um, with a carrier pigeon, also known as email, that brought me um, two reports from the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, along with a cry of help um, from our damsel in distress and knight in shining armor, Meg Cook. Um, Meg and her staff at MDAH had put in a lot of effort um, into research and analysis of a set of human remains, in fact, two um, individual sets of human remains um, that had been in um, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, um, but more accurately in a museum in the old Capitol building um, since at least the early 70s. Um, and this is where we're going to get to a bit more of the description. Uh, the individuals in this case um, in the 1970s um, were cemented into an exhibit case. Um, MDAH had very little information um, other than um, the, the ancestors themselves. Um, and so MDAH uh, undertook some exhaustive research to try to determine where the individuals were removed from. And um, sorry, there was a, a message, I got distracted. <laughs> um, so uh, MDAH had done a lot of work to try to identify where these individuals um, were removed from um, and how they came to be cemented in an exhibit case um, in the old Capitol or the Mississippi Historical Museum. Um, what uh, the MDAH staff were able to um, find in their research efforts really boiled down to two reports. And, and these two reports are pretty short um, there's not a ton of information, um, but this is what uh, the carrier pigeon email sent to me uh, along with the message from Meg saying, what, what do I do now? Here's what I know. Where do we go from here? And, um, you know, the, the details in both of the, the reports, there are two reports, one um, by the um, bioarchaeologist um, on the remains themselves, and another report by uh, staff who had done research um, in uh, the available records at MDAH on this exhibit. So what they know is that uh, the human remains represent at least two individuals. Um, there's some estimation about the age uh, and sex of at least one of the individuals, um, although again, um, it's hard to really do a thorough analysis because the remains are um, still encased in cement. 
Um, through records research, the staff were able to uncover that um, since about 1970 and until about 1982, um, this exhibit case was on display at the Old Capitol um, Mississippi Historical Museum and that the exhibit was titled Indian Burial. Um, in further research, um, the staff were able to identify um, where the remains were removed from. They were able to connect enough information um, in the records to identify that the, the remains as well as the few items that are with the remains in the exhibit case um, were removed from a site in Madison County, Mississippi. Um, that's all the information they have. And so as the wise uh, wizard in this story, uh, I told Meg that it seemed to me there was enough information here um, to culturally affiliate these human remains. Uh, we started by talking through what was required. So uh, first I asked her if there is um, an earlier group that has been identified as occupying Madison County, Mississippi. And she said, yes, uh, she described to me in, in great detail and in, in detail, I can't repeat um, of uh, the different uh, phases of occupation um, in Madison County, Mississippi. Um, next, I asked her if there are present day Indian tribes um, who are connected to Madison County, Mississippi. And she said, yes. Um, in fact, she uh, consults with them every month. And um, there are a, a number of tribes who um, have a history of occupation in Madison County. And I said, well, we've gotten two pieces of the puzzle here. The last one is, um, does the information you have show that there is a connection um, between the earlier group in Madison County, Mississippi and the present day Indian tribes? And she said, well, yes, of course, they, they, they have a history of occupation there. And I said, well, then that's the criteria for cultural affiliation. And despite the lack of information on this um, particular set of remains, the inability really to do any kind of um, analysis because they are encased in cement um, does not preclude moving ahead based on that location information and uh, consultation. So um, that's kind of where um, my part of the story ends. Um, and um, I think that I'm gonna turn it over to Meg here to talk about uh, where this took her once we had this conversation about um, cultural affiliation. Sure, thank you. Sure. No. So um, I went back and talked with some of my squires or my staff and uh, we we kind of openly talked about what this meant for the broader collection, not just this one case, but um, but all of the sites and all of the NAGPRA related materials that we have. And we consulted with our partners about it and decided that um, this broad geographical affiliation might be an opportunity for us to expand the way that we do the NAGPRA process and, and give some agency back to our tribal partners and sort of alleviate um, additional research that, that we might have been doing at the time, trying to come to um, decisions about cultural affiliation with certainty. And so what happened was is as we're still going through an initial inventory of our entire collections, we were able to broadly affiliate <clears throat> using geography to all of our tribal partners from Mississippi. Uh, in essence, we're saying, um, if you have a history of occupation in Mississippi and we can tie these individuals to Mississippi, then we're gonna affiliate to everybody and allow the tribes to make a decision on who wants to take the lead in the repatriation process. And that allowed us to really expedite repatriation. And the goal of, of NAGPRA is, is to complete the process. So immediately we had some success with Chickasaw Nation. And um, we were able to 
even though MDAH has only been uh, actively um, pursuing NAGPRA the last couple of years, we've now repatriated uh, 430 individuals and over 26,000 funerary objects uh, were able to make a lot of progress in a really short period of time by using a, a more broad perspective on affiliation. And this has a lot of, of benefits. It um, maximizes institutional resources. It certainly accelerated our process, but it also worked to um, work toward conciliation with our tribal partners. MDAH didn't have the best track record for uh, consulting or uh, engaging with tribal communities. And so this uh, sort of helped in all of those ways. So then that building on that idea um, and knowing that we had this platform for consultation that occurred every month where all of our tribal partners, anyone with interest in the state of Mississippi is welcome to join. It's a standing call. Um, we talked about the idea of trying to seek out all ancestors that have been removed from the state of Mississippi and working with other institutions as sort of a, a go-between trying to get these ancestors back to the state so that ultimately they can be reburied here. And the way that we hoped to accomplish this is through this broad affiliation. <clears throat> we found that our tribal partners work very well together. And uh, once we get individuals in a notice, um, even if we list multiple tribes, as tribes affiliated with the individuals, um, ultimately they are the ones who make the call on who will um, oversee the, the repatriation. So um, this guidance that I was given had really helped to kind of steer this into a larger project, not just the individuals at NDAH, but all the ancestors from Mississippi that were all over the United States. And to date, we are um, we've worked with 19 institutions. We call it the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative. We've worked with 19 institutions in 11 different states and also two private citizens who knew that they had um, individuals in their possession and wanted to oversee, um, wanted to see out <clears throat> that their repatriation. So it's been uh, largely successful, but what we found in working with some of these other institutions is that um, sometimes affiliation, especially broad geographical affiliation is a little bit of a hang up. Um, so, Though within our state, it has demonstrated a way to um, efficiently um, complete the NAGPRA process, there are some drawbacks, it seems, um, with institutions um, other than ourselves when it comes to affiliation. And I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with some of these, and I think that Amber will talk about them at length. Um, it's really revealed that many museums housing Native American remains are focused on finding the right affiliation. And sometimes they'll go as far as to develop additional research plans, whether or not they were solicited by the tribes, uh, but they'll develop these additional research plans um, in an effort to be able to determine the correct descendants. Um, and that's something that was just kind of confusing for me to deal with and, and seemed unnecessary and beyond um, what is required by the law. So having said that, I guess, um, I feel that affiliating through basic geographic information has been really beneficial um, on my part. And, um, and I'm hopeful that throughout this talk, you all will see how it might be beneficial for you as well. So rather than thinking within the confines of NAGPRA, so instead of thinking within the confines, um, I wanna kind of 
open your minds to think about a way that completes the process in lieu of added complexities. Um, NAGPRA does not require each line of evidence to be met in order to determine affiliation. And that's something we were seeing throughout the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative. It's, it's still ongoing. Um, there are many institutions that, that um, find it necessary to really focus on each line of evidence and explore each line of evidence exhaustively. Um, and as you can see from our story, we we had very little information, but we were able to use that and and uh, determine affiliation anyway. So I just want to think for a minute about this determination of affiliation and who is making those determinations, because we know that within the law, the institution is the one that uh, that makes this determination. But really, it's assigning a person's culture. That's what we're doing here. We're the people at the institutions are deciding which culture these people came from. <clears throat> I feel like the idea that institutions can determine affiliation with certainty is inherently flawed. Most of these institutions are a product of colonialist perspectives. And many members of these institutions who are making decisions about affiliation are outside of uh, the cultures that they're attempting to assign. I'm neither a part of nor descended from uh, Native American cultures. I don't assume, uh, no, knowing that about myself, uh, I don't assume that I, even through exhaustive research, uh, have the knowledge to make a correct determination of affiliation. Like many of you who are doing this work, who um, are not tribal members, I lack a comprehensive understanding of a lived experience uh, within, within this culture. I feel like an equitable NAGPRA process is one that moves away from institutional paternalism and relies on information from a native perspective. So through broad geographical affiliation, especially in the way that we're using it, um, I feel like it's it's been a, a way to really embrace the process in a different way and not assume that uh, just because the institution is the one that's making determinations about affiliation, that uh, it has to be done with absolute correctness. <clears throat> So, and also I just want to say that there are 10, more than 10 options uh, for determining affiliation, including basic geographical evidence and arguing, and you know, some of these institutions have argued that there might be a discontinuity in occupation at a site or uh, that, you know, direct lineage cannot be traced. And, and neither of those things should supplant a finding of affiliation. In fact, the law states that um, a finding of affiliation should not be precluded due to gaps in the record. So we're not looking to, um, to make a determination uh, and, and exhaustively looking through every single possible line of evidence to try to, to bring this to certainty and just get it, we just have to get it right. Uh, it's, it's really about using what you have. And also I'll say that treaties are useful in making affiliation determinations, but treaties are often based on arbitrary lines uh, created in government documentation. And it doesn't necessarily um, inform past or present uh, cultural boundaries. Uh, that's just not reality. So we really have to think about um, what types of information we're really relying on to make these determinations. You can't approach something like culture in a really um, binary manner. Um, there's no black and white. This is Muskogee. This is Choctaw. Uh, culture is a broader and more binary concept. 
I mean, I'm sorry, not binary. Culture is a broader, more fluid concept, as you know. Um, so, you know, I kind of want to think about moving away from this finite identification of this culture versus that culture, this affiliation or that affiliation. And this broad geographical um, affiliation allows us to do that because we're, as the institution, saying that it, it could be and is all of you. And um, based on your um, inherently uh, learned and, and known knowledge passed down, you get to make the decision as uh, tribal entities about, about what you feel the correct affiliation should be. Um, I think that some of the institutions that we've worked with um, throughout the process of the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative are sort of hung up on this idea of getting it right. And that is respectable, you know? Uh, certainly you don't wanna make an incorrect assumption about affiliation and then um, have to battle with competing claims. But um, sometimes getting it right means uh, spending a lot of valuable time and resources going beyond the available information into additional research plans. I mean, just taking great links and a lot of time. <clears throat> In this process, I just want to remind everybody, and, and I came to this realization, that this process of NAGPRA is not really meant to serve as an opportunity to, to you know, kind of flaunt your academic competence. It's more about um, completing the process. NAGPRA is, is there to return ancestors and objects. So um, for these institutions who seem to just cre be creating knowledge for knowledge sake, becoming experts on history and culture of Native American tribes, um, certainly seems like a, a righteous endeavor, but I just want to urge all of you to consider um, whether or not it, it was necessary for, to, for completion of NAGPRA and whether or not the additional research was really collaborative. Um, did you involve the tribes? Were the, were the tribes um, involved in this? And was it requested because it was gonna benefit you know, their history in some way. Ultimately, you really have to think about who this additional research is for. And in my experience with other institutions using, I'm sorry, in, in my experience with other institutions, um, these research efforts often benefit the institution and they're not so much geared at um, benefiting the tribes. So anyway, I just want to point out that I I am a NAGPRA practitioner. I am not a scientist. I do not find uh, within the verbiage of the law or within my occupation to make these determinations with scientific certainty. Um, really, we're trying to embrace a process that seeks a finding of affiliation using just the preponderance of evidence, whether or not it's more than likely. That's that's all. So based in law, uh, this is a way to really ethically fulfill our legal obligation. And so that is the message that I'm trying to get across to, to some of these institutions is that we can conserve resources and also get to completion of the process um, in a more expedient way through a finding of affiliation and, and through using just the available information, even if all it is is geography. At MDAH, if the available geographic information confirms that an individual was removed from Mississippi, affiliation is applied to all federally recognized tribes removed from or with interest in our state. Um, we do have one tribe that is, that is still currently residing in our state, but for the most part, it's a removal state. <clears throat> This approach, I, I get that it might not be ideal for everywhere. I know that California is a whole different scene, but um, in Mississippi anyway, um, 
it really has been useful. Um, geographical information absolves the need for unwanted supplementary research aimed at affiliating with specificity while maximizing institutional resources. This approach also minimizes the possibility of competing claims. So it's beneficial in that way, which is another reason I think that, um, you know, so many of these other institutions get really hung up on making the right determination um, because they don't want to make the wrong one and have these competing claims. But it, it, this is a simplified way to complete the process. But furthermore, it defines a really distinct role for our federally recognized tribal partners. And I think that that is really a take home point. Um, as I said earlier, this form of affiliation has really helped to accelerate our timeline for the NAGPRA process. And so here we are, um, you know, more than 30 years after the law is is put in place. And still, especially in the Southeast, there are tons of institutions who um, are, are compliant, but maybe not proactively engaged in the process. And, you know, the goal is to complete the process. I feel that um, while I may be working myself out of a job, it's an opportunity for me to um, take our agency through the process and create um, a collaborative uh, space for tribal partners and, and for our institution that's mutually beneficial. Um, I think also another thing that I wanted to point out is that broadly affiliating the multiple tribes with geographic ties to Mississippi enables our tribal partners um, to have a voice in the NAGPRA process that's different than just our institution determining, uh, making all the determinations and taking all the time to, um, to get it right or get it correct. <clears throat> and I think that as they define those roles in this process, it really has created a collaborative uh, partnership in actuality. Like, I feel like so many uh, institutions use buzzwords like equitable, culturally responsive, um, you know, inclusion. But, but this is what collaboration looks like in actuality. Meeting together, uh, constant consultation, monthly calls where, um, where we say the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and sometimes it's not in that order. So um, it, it's really an opportunity for us to engage in a transparent process and give back to, um, to descendants of these ancestors in a way that they are able to uh, have agency. So, you know, another thing that I see sometimes with these institutions is that um, it seems that we forget that tribal entities are sovereign nations, many of them. And I am of the opinion that a sovereign nation has the ability to determine um, their own ancestors' affiliation uh, in absence of the institutional influence. Um, and in this way, geographic affiliation serves as a tool, really, to create decision-making opportunities um, that emphasize the Native voice, uh, not the institutions. I, my role for my institution um, is to comply with the law, and the law tells me to complete the process. So for me, it's a whole lot less about getting it right and a whole lot more about how do I get it done. So in in essence, that's what I'm trying to, um, to get across here. So um, in Mississippi, at least, uh, we've really benefited from the use of geographic affiliation. It's an effective way for us to complete NAGPRA within the legal requirements while maximizing institutional resources 
expediting a process that is long overdue and empowering our federally recognized tribal partners, which is something that um, is probably perceived as um, activism. And that's okay. I, I feel like um, maybe this is more a part of actually realizing the intent of the law and less about political motivation. So I encourage you to think about that. Um, this is really an opportunity and it served as an opportunity for MVAH to approach NAGPRA and the management of archeological collections outside of this colonialist perspective while still meeting the requirements. Um, now, while the law does not require affiliation, it, it still requires completion of the process. Um, so this is a chance for you to really use us as kind of a case study, use our story and explore the way um, that you might be able to push your agency beyond just compliance into completion. Um, if you're engaged in NAGPRA work, I think that we all have to consider um, being stewards of these individuals and their things. And if we are stewards of the past, we also need to be stewards of the present. Presently, tribes still exist. Um, currently, they still have a connection to the people in your care who, who came from these past groups. And that's all you need in order to affiliate and, and move forward. And so to this end, I argue that, that getting it right is getting it done. Um, and that's sort of where we are in, in the process. We're still working with these other institutions and we're pushing this message of um, NAGPRA can be easier than, than this exhaustive research. NAGPRA can be um, truly a collaborative effort with your tribal communities and, and it should be. And this has benefited our agency in so many ways that are beyond just NAGPRA because NAGPRA consultation has now grown into um, museum interpretation consultation and uh, merchandising consultation representing um, our tribal partners and the people who um, have homelands within our state in a different way. And so um, ultimately it has been very beneficial we are still in the process of, of seeking out all of the ancestors that have been removed from Mississippi. MDAH is serving as a repository for those who are awaiting reburial from other institutions. We're also working to um, file joint notices with other institutions who do not wish to transfer directly to our institution to ensure repatriation and additionally, um, we have been able to apply this broad geographic affiliation in many of those cases where other institutions have been stuck up on, on the research. They're kind of just, they have been stuck in years, but well, we, we drew a line because this is all we knew. Um, but really, if, you, if the available information gives you enough, um, then certainly uh, moving away from from unidentifiable, I feel, is uh, a better option. And so I think that um, where we are in the story at this point is attempting to mount a white horse and and um, ready the troops so that so that we can progress on and and try to help the townspeople um, in, in their endeavors as well. So with that, I'll pass it on to Amber. Hello, everyone. I'm here to share with you a little bit about our story in this repatriation. Um, back in 2014, the Chickasaw Nation decided to um, reach out and try to repatriate over 8,000 of our ancestors who were from our homelands which are Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky, as well as our 13 county reservation here in Oklahoma. We were um, met by many roadblocks along the way. A lot of those roadblocks were based in fear and lack of understanding. 
Um, many of the agencies were afraid they would lose their collection. They didn't fully understand what to expect through the uh, repatriation process. They had some budgetary concerns, concerns about how to properly consult. But the barrier that we most often faced with this um, 8,000 ancestors that were considered CUI was the institution telling us that they needed to do a complete re-inventory because their information they had was lacking. Often they would give us their research plans, which would last perhaps a decade in several cases. And these were ancestors that had already been in their collection for nearly a century. So for us, that was not ideal. We wanted the ancestors returned and we wanted them returned in a timely manner, not to sit on boxes and shelves for you know, another decade. So we began collaborating with our tribal partners and we decided to go ahead and pursue repatriating the ancestors through the CUI regulations. However, there was a downfall to that. If the institution chose to, they could keep the associated funerary objects. Fortunately to date, only two institutions chose to keep them. And one recently apologized for that decision and submitted a notice to return those to us. That was important because we always pursue repatriation of the human remains along with their funerary objects, knowing that they belong together. So we were seemingly faced with two options. One, we could wait an exorbitant amount of time to ensure that we got the ancestors and their funerary objects, or two, risk the chance that the objects that were lovingly placed with them might not be returned to be placed back with them in their final resting place. This is when we learned from the White Knight about broad geographical affiliation. Through this avenue, we could still jointly repatriate the ancestors with the federally recognized tribes who have a connection to the land, and this would ensure the return of their funerary objects along with them. For us, this was a game changer, and we encourage other institutions to follow the lead the MDAH has set. They have had clear and frequent consultation with the tribes. They have quickly re-inventoried their collections without excess research, and they are facilitating the return of our ancestors to us in a respectful manner. We are forever grateful to, that, to them and Melanie for this, and we are happy to say that we have almost completed our goal of getting all 8,000 ancestors returned to us. Um, Yakoke, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Amber. Um, so we do have some some questions um, that um, I'll go ahead and read the questions and and ask um, Meg and Amber to to answer. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first question, Meg, is is for you. Is the Mississippi Initiative focusing on ancestors and objects, or are you also doing repatriations of other cultural items? Uh, for now, we are focused on uh, ancestors and funerary objects removed from Mississippi, but we have worked with at least two institutions that have uh, heard about our initiative and reached out and said, mm, we think we might have some things. And in those cases, we have worked as uh, a liaison to provide images of cultural items that are in collections outside of our care. Um, to our tribal partners. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Amber, a, a question for you um, that you may choose not to answer um, is um, which institutions are not repatriating funerary objects under uh, the, the culturally unidentifiable regulations? Oh, you're on mute, Amber. I would encourage you to attend the upcoming review committees because um, you may find out some of that information in those meetings. For, for those of you um, attending today, Amber's referring to the um, NAGPRA review committee um, who is holding two meetings this month, uh, the first on November 12th and the second on November 23rd. You can find information actually on the, the November 12th uh, in the schedule for the conference. Um, 
All right, uh, Meg, a, a question for you um, on the process of broad geographical affiliation. Um, once you've made that determination, do the tribal partners then come in and consult with one another to decide on a more specific affiliation? Right. The the institution at that point has fulfilled its legal obligation. And I'm not sure what happens with intertribal uh, consultation, and that's okay because um, they're allowed to have conversations within and amongst themselves, removing the institution from the whole process. So um, from what I understand, there are pretty um, clear uh, lines of evidence that they uh, kind of follow within within them their own communities and those determines are then those determinations are then made within um, the tribal entities I don't know if Amber might have more to add to that yes for the southeastern tribes we you know we work together often and we've developed very close relationships and we've done numerous joint repatriations together so it's not a um, you know, a fighting amongst the tribes about who's going to do it. It's rather um, who will take the honor for this one. And many times we include each other. You know, we've had repatriations with Cherokee, Choctaw, several of the other tribes where we join together at that ceremony and place those ancestors, you know, back to rest. So it's a it's a beautiful process and not one that, you know, has any type of fighting or anything like that. Thank you. Um, that was exactly the answer I was hoping, uh, Meg, you would offer, that you don't know what happens because uh, that's not the institution's role. And that leads to um, the other question we have, which, which I will actually answer, and that is, um, what do you do when you believe that there is a broad cultural affiliation, um, but the tribes involved do not want to consult um, because there's ambiguity on the ancestors or the funerary objects? Um, and in particular that they're not from an exact location. So in this case, the, the question is that, um, the, that the institution knows the ancestral culture, they know the modern tribes, and that there is a connection, uh, but doesn't have additional information on the exact location. And it sounds like in this circumstance, then the tribes are um, perhaps uh, not wanting to engage as much as uh, you've described, Meg, with the, the um, southeastern tribes being engaged. And, you know, I think there's a couple of answers to this question. Um, and, and probably the first is to inform the tribes uh, of your intent. And if your intent is to repatriate um, and to culturally affiliate, uh, then you should move forward with a notice. And then at that point, the institution has completed its process and uh, the tribes can then determine what's the next step. Now, I will add to this that there are tribes in um, particular locations in the country where a cultural affiliation decision um, actually does not work, um, that the tribes in particular have such a, a, um, divisive histories where, where the, 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 their ancestral histories are in conflict. And so a cultural affiliation is, is challenging for them. Um, in some of those cases, we have seen the tribes actually preferring to use the culturally unidentifiable process based on geography um, to resolve uh, some of those um, uh, conflicts. Um, so, you know, I think that from my perspective, what I would um, encourage the, the museum to do here um, is to, number one, inform the tribes of what your intent is, that your intent is to repatriate um, and to affiliate if, if that's what the tribes want, um, and that you have an obligation um, to move forward with a notice under, uh, under the regulations and the law. Um, you need to move forward with that notice within six months of determining affiliation. And so uh, then you can ask the tribes what they would like you to do. And, and if at that point, they would prefer uh, to use culturally unidentifiable for some other cultural reason, then that's an option. Um, or you can move forward with your notice. And at that point, the institution can remove itself from the process, as Meg said. And uh, it is up to the tribes then um, to decide what the next steps are. 
Um, and I think that answers the Q&A. There was one other question we had in the chat itself that I wanted to get to. Um, and I'm I'm sorry about my dog. Um, must be the mailman coming by. Um, uh, the question in the chat actually is for you, Meg. Um, and and that is if if you've identified in in your efforts with the Repatriate in Mississippi Initiative, um, what is the what is the risk in the professional um, realm? Um, for taking this broad affiliation, is there is there some kind of risk uh, for those who who implement a, a sort of broad affiliation approach? Um, is is there a risk for them in their own um, professional networks, in um, their own ability to um, uh, perhaps uh, climb a professional ladder? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question, and I'm wondering if that's some of the reason that there are institutions that kind of have a reticence to engage in, in this process. For, uh, for, you know, me personally, certainly there are um, a lot of roadblocks that, that we navigate. Fortunately, um, I have steadfast squires and uh, <laughs> a, a lot of armor. So that is helpful. Um, and I don't know how it will affect me uh, ultimately professionally, but I think certainly um, other institutions and the individuals who have been um, working through this process may um, have suffered some pushback. And I'm not sure if that's a greater institutional um, kind of methodology for the process that's at work uh, behind the scenes or or if it really is just, you know, personal. So um, I hope that answers the question, but it's it's not, in some cases it's incredibly easy and the institutions are super willing to be transparent. They've been embarrassed for years knowing this information and not being able to move forward. And, uh, you know, we invite them to come and engage with the tribal partners and, and they're, super willing to to move the process along. And in other situations, um, you know, there's, it's very slow. It's a slow um, process. And um, I'm sort of a, if we're going to do it, let's do it kind of person. Uh, so that that is a struggle for me, certainly. But I think what's more perplexing for me is understanding or, or trying to understand why with relation to individuals removed from the state of Mississippi, if this is shown to be an effective way, an expedient way, and a way that conserves resources to repatriate, why it's not embraced um, more openly? So um, good question. And if you find an answer, let me know. <laughs> so I, I wonder if you guys wouldn't mind just um perhaps while we wait for other folks to ask questions, or you can also raise your hand and engage with us on audio and video. Um, I know that in this process, um, Amber, you um, and the Chickasaw Nation um, have allowed me to, um, to see and, and eventually share um, the claim letters that you submitted to MDAH over the, the many, many years. And, um, you know, I, I know that the first claim letter that was submitted to MDAH was in 2015. Um, it was followed up then in 2018 and then 2019. Uh, and then again, two more claims in 2020. And um, I guess maybe first, Amber, could you talk a little bit about um, what uh what 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 you saw in MDAH over that time in that that five year period from from submitting the first claim to um 2020 when when the large repatriation occurred yes um i will say that as melanie has nicely told me before i can sometimes put the nag in nagpra <laughs> We submitted our claims beginning in 2014 to numerous agencies and institutions and MDH was one of those. And um, monthly, every month I would follow up and say, okay, knock, knock, here we are. 
we're ready for our ancestors to be returned. And oftentimes during that time period, um, those doors were not opened. But I would just continue the following month to call, email, you know, write another letter, whatever it took. But every month from 2014 to now, there has been communication with all agencies that we have pursued repatriation from. Um, I will say Meg was the 100% the reason that there was a change. Um, there was a change in staffing. And whenever Meg came on board, she traveled to Oklahoma and met with us. And I was a little bit gruff with her, if I recall correctly. But, um, you know, there was some frustration there, but she was very open and, you know, told us what had gone wrong in the past and that she would promise to make sure it would not be that way going forward. And she has kept that promise. And since that time, you know, we talk sometimes daily, but at least once a month. And there's been very clear communication and just openness and dialogue between us and the other tribes that she consults with. And it, her coming on board has made the change, honestly. Thanks. Um, Meg, could you talk a little bit about what it was like to um, to come into your position and have a, a pile of claim letters on your desk? Yeah, I was um, I was considering offering some clarification about that. Uh, I um, I asked to take over the archaeology collection at MDAH. Um, I was originally working for um, the museum collections that are not uh, Native American. They're, they're, you know, governor's favorite teapot and that kind of thing. And um, we were at a at a juncture where where I had an opportunity and I, I noticed having a background in archaeological training, I noticed that the archaeological collections was kept in a separate building um, on a third floor was rarely accessed and it was in uh, terrible shape. Uh, there was no um, basic catalog inventory of anything that that was there. And so I'm like, get, let me take over that collection. You know, we'll get it in shape. And um, that's when uh, I realized that no one had really been engaging in NAGPRA at all. And we've been open since 1902. And some of our collections go back that far. And we've also been involved in systematic excavations um, yearly on some of our own properties and also some private properties. And also people had just been dropping things off. And there was no um, there was no rhyme or reason uh, to how the collection was organized. So so when I realized this it was going to be more than just organizing a collection and cataloging everything, when I realized that there were people and funerary objects, um, it became a long process of trying to educate our administrative staff and and myself uh, because, you know, traditional education just doesn't teach NAGPRA um, in a way that um, sort of assists with actual implementation. Uh, it's more about the concept of the law and ethics, and and it's not really like th this is what it is to to make an inventory, and then this is how you draft a notice. Um, so so it took some time, but the best thing that I knew to do was uh, was let our higher ups know, hey, this is a problem, and um, they were like, yeah, what are you going to do about that? And uh, and so we took the trip to Oklahoma and, and we put it all out on the table. Like I said, the, the good, the bad and the ugly. And it was mostly bad and ugly at first. So um, but but we continue that transparency and we've embraced this um, kind of motto of transparency, respect and connection. And and so we hope that in being uh, transparent and respectful of our tribal partners that that we can reach a better connection. So <clears throat> the process of figuring out what to do with those those claims was um, it was intimidating. But once we kind of figured out how how to get started, 
the broad geographic affiliation really helped um, move things along. And, and once I got to know our tribal partners a little better and realized that they're so um, they're just such a, a good group who works together so well um, that that I wasn't needed from an institutional perspective to to push this thing along that 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 decision can be their their own and so that has really been the success is is the inner tribal relationships. I wonder, Meg, if if you can identify. Um any connection between um, the change in staffing at MDAH um, and Amber's uh, gentle or not so gentle reminders um, of, of MDAH's responsibility. Is there a connection there between uh, Amber's nagging um, and, and the changes in staffing? Um, I think yes, and, and partially because um, I think that those the staffing issues had been identified, and then I was um, the one who was crazy enough to be like, "Come on, just let me take over that thing. Like you, you don't even have to give me a raise. Just let me try." And oh man, I should have negotiated that a little better. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that those things were going on, and then when they knew that I had the training um, to manage a collection like that, they're like, "All right, let's." let's put two and two together here. Um, but ultimately, I think it was also about institutional change. We were at a period in time when um, some important figures in our administration were retiring, some new uh, people were coming on board. And also, um, you know, as far as institutional change goes, um, when your when your stakeholders change, or when administration kind of shifts in a way um, it's helpful. And so, or it can be helpful. It can also be harmful, but, but in our case, it was very helpful. And um, certainly they were willing to own up to a long history of, um, you know, pu pushing these people back on the shelf and, and they knew it was time to kind of face it. So, yeah. I think there was there was definitely a correlation. Um, so I have a, a question, um, actually, for both of you. Um, if if you have identified what um, motivates um, institutions who are not as active or who um, do take a different approach to um, getting it right. Um, in in terms of affiliation, do you, can you identify what what they gain? Um, from that approach, um, the, the question actually is, what do they gain from it other than keeping collections? Well, some of the agencies that are a little bit more reluctant to return the remains to us or engage in repatriation, you know, it's simply that they may be teaching universities and things like that, and they really just do not want to return the ancestors or the objects. Um, they still want to do studies on them. And sometimes, like I mentioned in my speech, you know, it's budgetary concerns. They're not sure exactly what all NAGPRA consultation involves. And, you know, they sometimes think that they're going to need to have numerous in-person meetings and maybe fly all the tribes out there. I'm not sure exactly what their thought process is. But once I have been able to kind of share with them what our experience has been and, you know, how it has been successful for us with consultation and that there's really not been any budgetary, you know, need in many of the cases, especially with the small collections, then they were um, a little bit more ready to get on board. And then sometimes it's just, you know, their fear of the unknown. They don't really know how to do it in IC. They, they're not sure how to reach out to the tribes. And oftentimes I try to help and walk them through that process or appoint them to Melanie and her team and have them kind of shed some light on that. And then, the, you know, the repatriation often goes very quickly from that point because they may only have one ancestor or five ancestors, something that is relatively simple in the NAGPRA world. But um, 
one thing I did notice was that, you know, when we first started back in 2014, CUI repatriation was fairly new still. And so a lot of them were really hesitant just because our claims were under that. And once we got a few institutions on board and we were able to successfully repatriate, we were then able to show the other agencies and institutions copies of those notices and things that had gone on. And that really kind of seemed to be a turning point and they were um, more readily able to move forward with this because they saw it had been done in the past and you know it went successfully. I can point out um, some direct experiences from the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative. Uh, some of the larger institutions that have well-staffed uh, NAGPRA programs were immediately um, dismissive and uh, we don't need your ins your uh, institution's assistance. We're already consulting. That's, you know, um, and that was that. And so um, I too know how to put the NAG in NAGPRA. And um, it was a process of trying to explain that um, this is not about taking your collections. This is about assisting the process of repatriation. And it and it can happen this way. Um, and there's only been one instance where affiliation has really turned into a problem. Most of the institutions that ori originally um, opted not to work with us have since come around and said, wow, I, I see now that this is like a great opportunity. And you have this ongoing dialogue with um, tribes removed from Mississippi, and that makes our job easier if you can just loop us into, into a consultation rather than us trying to seek out exactly who we need to talk to, introduce ourselves, have this, you know, build a, a relationship and earn trust and then figure out how to go through the repatriation process and what's best. So, um, so I think some of the you know, some of it is really just trying to look at things in a different way. I also think that some institutions are reticent to give back funerary objects. Um, in the Southeast in particular, there are institutions who will gladly repatriate ancestors and would rather hang on to the funerary objects because they, um, you know, uh, might have a museum that that is comprised of all funerary objects. And so, that is a difficult conversation. In, in those um, situations, I suggest buying lots of donuts and sugaring everybody from the low man on the, the pole all the way up to, um, you know, the, the president of the, the institution. So, and, and just trying to figure out how we can, how we can talk about this more, more um, effectively. But additionally, um, what's that? Oh, I was just, I was, uh, I was going to wrap up, but that's okay. Go ahead. Additionally, <laughs> sorry. Additionally, uh, there are some institutions that simply um, use it as an opportunity to research. And um, I think that that is probably the worst of all is that um, in essence are capitalizing on um, ancestors and their objects um, in a way that's, that's not respectful or really um, useful for the individuals from which they came. Yeah, thank you, Meg. And I want to just point out in the chat, there are several other people who have talked to this question in particular um, about um, what what are the motivations um, and uh, barriers. And, and certainly it's something we continually talk about um, in this work. And there are a couple of other questions I want to get to, and I think I can actually answer these uh, fairly quickly. Um, uh, in regards to what the law requires. Um, so one question is, if there are tribes that are geographically affiliated but choose not to participate, how does this affect the process or affiliations listed in the notice of inventory completion? And the answer is, it does not. If you can find affiliation, um, then you should proceed with the notice, and the notice should identify all of those tribes that you have identified as being affiliated. The notice then gives an opportunity for somebody else to come forward who may not be listed in the notice, um, but then it also provides the opportunity for any of those um, tribes that are identified in the notice to come forward um, and to repatriate. 
So your role as the institution um, is really to publish that notice um, to get to a place where you're identifying who has a right um, to these ancestors and, and objects in your collection. Um, and then at that point, it becomes then um, the tribes listed in the notice uh, who can decide how they want to participate. So uh, a lot of times people think that a notice um, is somehow the final step um, where you where you report all of your uh, all of your work and agreements, and and that's not the case. Um, it is the interim step where a museum has taken its information, combined it with consultation, and publishes a notice to say, "Here's what we know." Um, and then there's an opportunity for somebody else to come forward, um, but but also then for the tribes to take the next step um, in making that request. Uh, to repatriate. And it may be one of the tribes listed. It may be a, a group of them. That That's up to the tribes at that point. The responsibility of the institution is to, to um, get the job done with the publication of the notice. And that leads a little to the other question here, which is um, what are some of the current numbers of the culturally unidentifiable and, and where are the majority of them uh, removed from? Um, the National NAGPRA program reports statistics on um, uh, inventories of human remains and, and funerary, human remains and funerary objects um, annually. Um, I haven't quite finished uh, the report for um, the end of the fiscal year, which just finished in September. But I can tell you that um, we're still right around about 110, or, or we were last year, at 110,000 individuals that are removed from known locations um, in uh, the United States, uh, as well as Alaska and Hawaii, um, that are not listed in notices. Uh, there are only about 6,000 uh, individuals listed in inventories uh, that have no identified geographic location. Um, the, I will um, put a link in the chat to a, a visual map where you can see the, the largest states um, certainly um, the largest number of, of human remains that are still waiting to go through the NAGPRA process uh, were removed from the state of Illinois. Um, I think second is um, Kentucky, perhaps California is, is in there in the top three. Um, it shifts a little each year, um, but that's kind of where we, we stand right now. Um, and then uh, another question here, that I think I can answer too is um, if anybody, and, and then I'll turn it to you as well to answer, um, if you have recommendations on how a museum um, can start the consultation process uh, so that they're making the best use of their time and not getting uh, too far ahead. Um, I tell museums all the time, and I'm fairly certain I told Meg this um, when we started our quest together, uh, that the most important thing that you can do when you start communicating and consult and consulting with tribes is is to to declare your intent that your intent is to repatriate that your intent is to affiliate if you make that clear at the very beginning then the tribes have an understanding of where you are um, and and where you want to go and and when you do that I think it starts a different kind of conversation um, I think it's important for everybody in this work, but particularly museums, to understand how hard it has been for tribal representatives like Amber um, for so long to have to continually work at chipping away at this at this work. Um, and so I I encourage museums to start a conversation by saying what your intent is. If your intent is to broadly affiliate to repatriate as much as you can, then say that up front. So the tribes know what kind of relationship they're entering. Amber, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think that's great advice. I think the tribes will just be happy that you are reaching out to them, honestly, and that they're not having to chase you down. So just, you know, a phone call, an email introducing yourself, you know, letting them know what you have in the collection that, you know, you think they may be interested in or just starting that dialogue. Because honestly, communication is the key ingredient in successful NAGPRA work. 
I agree. And, and when you think about whether or not you're ready to start consultation um, <clears throat> and when to begin, start yesterday um, as soon as possible. I, but I think Melanie has a point. If you have an intent, um, then, then start then. If you even have a basic idea of where you think that you're headed, um, just just start making those phone calls. And I think Meg and MGH is an excellent example. You know, many times we've seen where universities and museums don't want to approach the tribes until they have everything pristine. And, you know, coming to the table and just saying, you know, it's in bad shape, but we're going to make a change. You know, that was all that was needed, just some transparency and some dialogue, you know, just let us know where you're at honestly. And, you know, we can move forward from there. Thank you both. Um, there's a, another question here for you, Meg, on funding, um, and, and this might help others too. Um, how does the funding work um, for uh, the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative? Um, does MDAH have an ongoing NAG for grant funding or is it built into um, the state budget? Good question. We do have an ongoing uh, NAG for grant, but it is not related directly to the Repatriate Mississippi Initiative. The Repatriate Mississippi Initiative really doesn't require much in the way of funding outside of um, phone calls, emails, and um, we do travel to transfer um, ancestors physically, but for the most part, it all just happens over the phone or over email. If we file joint notices, um, it, it hasn't required much extra work. So I would encourage, um, anybody who feels like um, there might be a shared collection or a split collection with another institution that's very easy just to communicate about um, those particular individuals or objects to try to get them repatriated at the same time together. Having said that, we did, um, we were awarded a Save America's Treasures grant, a very large grant that um, will allow us to buy a vehicle that will be used specifically for NAGPRA transfers that's more appropriate than the, the vehicles that we've currently been using. So um, so there'll be a little bit of grant um, assistance happening there, but thank you for asking that. And, and Meg, I wanted to um, highlight something that, that you didn't raise when you were talking about the initiative, um, but it's always struck me as, as one of the crucial parts of this work. Um, and, and that is that you work for a state agency and, and your state agency's responsibility are to the people of Mississippi. That's who you serve, that's who you work for. And in, the, in, the, um, in what you've said about the, the initiative, um, I know that you talk about how uh, the role of the state is to serve not just the people who presently live in the state of Mississippi, but the people who have lived there um, uh, who have always lived there. And that means the ancestors and objects that were removed from those lands that are now within the state. And I think it's a wonderful statement. Um, and I, uh, you know, I really encourage everybody um, to think about your own state historical society or your own state um, office that, that has these responsibilities for historic preservation. Um, and if they have that same approach of, of service, not just to um, some people in the state, but to all people, whether they're um, presently living or not. And I think that's a wonderful message for states um, and, and state historic offices to, um, to represent. And y'all can call me with questions about how to do it. Uh, so there's lots more conversation in, in the chat happening, and I'm, I'm actually having a hard time um, keeping up with it all. I think that a lot of the questions have been answered or asked there have been answered by, by other folks, which is a really great part of this kind of uh, conference and, and conversation. Um, I think we've covered all of the questions that are in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if uh, Shannon or Colleen, if uh, if either of you want to want to pop in. Um, it looks like we have about eight minutes left um, in this session. Happy to help. Nobody wanted to to pop in with audio or video to to discuss anything. 
Um, and if, if that's the case, then I guess we'll go to some polls. Melanie, did you have any particular polls? I uh, no, we we didn't have any. Um, didn't I have think any? either. All right. Well, I hope everyone. Will, sorry, I hope everyone okay. will stay on a few minutes, and we'll do a few polls here. Great. So the first one is this session challenged some of my understandings of repatriation practices. Did this challenge you a little bit? I hope so. We've got 10 votes. We've got 165 people in session. So we hope we can get those numbers up. Everyone can push on a yes or a no. And those of you who weren't challenged, either that's because you know all of this stuff already and you're working um, for good in NAGPRA to benefit tribes or perhaps you just don't want to. While we're waiting on the poll results, I will give a plug for the uh, NAGPRA community of practice. Meg, Melanie, and I all participate in that twice a month, and it is a great place if you're new to NAGPRA or just kind of wanting to build some relationships to um, di get together and discuss NAGPRA, and I think there's a little booth here at the AAIA conference for that. There sure is, and I think... Uh... Um, the next NAGPRA community of practice will actually be a uh, part of uh, the conference. Mm -hmm. All right, let's close this poll. Thank you, everyone. We've got 85% um, saying yes, this was uh, help to challenge. Uh, let's do another one. Oops, which one did I do? Here we go. I gained information that I'll take back and implement in my own work or share with others. Everyone, please take a second to smash. Is that what you're supposed to do? Smash, yes or no? Smush, what's the um, proper terminology our kids use? I, I don't know. I, I, I think you're supposed to smash that button. Um, that's I think what they say these days. Okay. So um, I want to take the opportunity to put in a plug for uh, one of the sessions this afternoon on tribal coalitions. Um, it's at, at 2.30. And I think um, what didn't come out of this session, um, but is an integral part of, of the work um, that Amber and Meg have done is, is actually the fact that there is a, a Southeastern um, Tribal Alliance um, for repatriation that has made a, a huge impact on how the process works and, and how it works smoothly. So let's do one final, one final poll question. Did you like this session? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, we have a, a all day sessions happening all day today through 7.45 PM Eastern. Uh, with a little bit of break here and there. Um, if you're not too sure what to do on your break, you can come back into the um, lounge area of the uh, of our virtual port portal and see who's there and chat and network. Remember, you can also find people um, uh, in at the conference um, on the people button up top to your right, and you can send folks direct messages. Uh, don't forget to look at who our sponsors are um, in our booth section, as well as visit some of our uh, vendors and exhibitors there. All right, we're going to close this poll. Thank you all for participating and um, whatever last words uh, that our panel members would like to share. Put the nag in nag, bro. Everything bad.